Anyway, all right. So I, I've started recording. All right. So cool. So hey guys, Curran here. I'm here with my friend Robert. He's got some questions about the first video, and we might do some iteration on this responsive starter code. But wait a minute. What's in this video anyway? We discussed the following things in an informal question-answer kind of format. Why does the CSS trick for full screen work? How to approach grid layouts for visualizations? Does select body select that iframe in DataViz Tech where the code runs? What is that Rx attribute? Is there an Ry? Can we set the position styles in JavaScript? And we discussed the pros and cons of CSS, you know, style tags versus inline styles in JavaScript. Why is that rectangle black if you didn't set the fill color to be black? Then we discuss SVG defaults for XY and fill. And what's the deal with that dot data null? Then we spend a lot of time going a deep dive on the general update pattern, and then we explore a nested version of the general update pattern. Okay, the first question I have about the video, my response in this was, what's up with that CSS trick? Uh, sure. Don't know if that's just for database.tech, if that's something that we should know about, and other responses that we write, what's, what's going on there? Sure, yeah, that's um, CSS in general. It'll work on any web page. And the idea is that position fixed lets you specify a position relative to the whole browser window. So, which is different from position of relative or position of, uh, I don't know, block. There's all these other CSS options. Yeah. But position fixed means that you can say uh, top and left as zero pixels to make sure that it goes up to the upper left corner. And then you can also say yeah. bottom zero pixels to make it so that the gap between the bottom of that thing that you're styling and the bottom of the browser window is zero pixels. That's what bottom means. It's the gap uh, from the bottom of the browser window. It works. It works for height, but you actually didn't need the CSS trick for width. I think width was fine. But then when you go to the console and the logs to height value, you got zero. And you pointed out that it was weird. But, Here we go. And you fixed it. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was actually a point of the video I recorded but edited out because I thought it added too much time. Where I went through and deleted all of these things to see, like each one individually I got rid of to see if it would still compute the right thing. So if I get rid of left, we don't get the right width after all. Because we were getting the right width before oh, yeah. before we applied position fixed, we were getting the right width. But right. but now that the body is position fixed, if we don't specify left, we get the wrong width, and if we don't specify right, we get the wrong mm. width, and if we don't specify left or right, we don't we don't get the Got width it. that we need. Okay, so really that should be applied to both. It's it's necessary for the responsiveness regardless of what situation you're in. Yeah, that's right, that's yeah. right. And like there's probably a couple other ways to do it with CSS, but like over the years this is what I've sort of ended up coming back to because it's like super can solid. Talk about, can you talk about an example where you might not be going for a full width responsiveness, but you're going for, um, let's say, a, a like series of like, grouped elements, um, like a small multiples. Is it going to be you're going to you're going to take that outer width and then you're going to use that and divide it by the number of columns or rows that you might want? This technique of grabbing the client width and client height on any DOM element, yep. it will work mm -hmm. with uh, grid frameworks like Bootstrap. Bootstrap has a super duper grid framework, maybe you've used it. And uh, yeah, yeah. Semantic UI has their own grid layout too. So you could totally use uh, any of those and put divs in a grid layout and then mm -hmm. access the client width and client height of those divs. Um, and then put the SVG inside of there and use the width and height, and then you'll get this like nice gridded, uh, responsive layout. But 
I, I found that yeah. a lot of in a lot of projects in the past, like I wanted to utilize all the space available, but then subdivide it mm. with no with no gaps. Yeah. And so in this mm. example, I'm using this library that I wrote called D3 Boxes, where um, mm. it's the same sort of thing: position fixed, left, right, top, bottom yeah. of all zero. And this time it's applied to mm. a div rather than the body, you know, which has the same yeah, effect. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. so we're just putting the SVG inside of that chart div, and then mm. there's this there's this uh, layout definition here. So it says, okay, on the outside we subdivide it uh, vertically, and the children are a some nested thing and D. Yeah. So if we correlate that with what's up here, we've got A on the top, a, nest, a nested structure with a, ver, a, a horizontal split, and then D on the bottom. Yeah. And this... Great. you got to walk through your D3 boxes next. Right? <laughs> yeah, I would like to do a, like, a proper tutorial on how to use D3 boxes, because, you know, I think it is a reasonable solution. And I've, I've tried and banged my head for hours against the Flexbox CSS stuff, which... Hmm. You know, supposedly you could do the same thing easily, but I just never got it to work right. Yeah. So I want to point out, if yeah. you open up this in a new window, see how this resp resizes? Yeah, that's great. It's more like uh, elastic, you know. Hmm. Interesting. I noticed that you right select body and somehow that selects the iframe and just like knows what the width of the iframe here is and i was surprised that that worked the way that it did um i might be might be off here but i'm thinking about you know the width of your screen but somehow when you do select body in this code it selects the iframe that we're writing code in how does that how does that happen? Right. Well, yeah. this whole thing is sandboxed inside this iframe. So this code here doesn't have any knowledge of the outer page at all. I see, I see. I see. And okay. so if see. you were to if you were to just copy this into a local file and run it, it would work just the same. Because really what it's listening to is the client width and client height on the body element yeah. which is happens to be inside the iframe. Right. Okay. And so right. this so that's this CSS tells it, okay, occupy all the space that you can within your context, which could be a, a, an iframe or an actual browser. That's, that's good to know it's portable. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to just touch on is that our X attribute is our, our Y attribute. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> RX and RY. You know, I was always confused by that myself because it turns out if you set RY, it has the same effect, you know? So I don't, I don't fully understand the point of different... You know, I think I just need to research it more. Like, what if they're different? Like, what is it... Yeah, so if they're different values, that's when it only that's when it makes sense to have them as separate. Like one is there's, the, it there's one, no R. I don't think there's an R, but let's try it. Is there an R? No, it's just RX and RY. So I think it's like the roundedness. How rounded is it in the X direction and the Y direction? <laughs> that sort of thing. But if you just if you just specify one, it seems to yeah. automatically set the other to be the same. Okay. So it's one of Let's those. Let's get it It's sort and of a weird little quirk. And I haven't ever used it to get a sense of where my rectangle is. But you're right. If you don't set it, then it's you don't know how filled your screen is. If it's overflowing or not. You know? Yeah. That could be that could go on for infinity. Yeah, exactly. Maybe, you know. And actually, in a previous iteration of this uh, tutorial, I used more complex code, which is this. Uh, mm. This is the idea where it's the same technique of position fixed, and instead of making a rounded okay. rectangle, it's adding these two lines. 
But then I had this realization. What about setting? What's that? What about setting that style, the the style attributes in the HTML? Obviously, you can do it in with the style tag in your head, but. I'm wondering if you can also do it in your script tag down in the body. Just D3, select body, and then set the position left, right, top, bottom. Oh, yeah, to, yeah. Uh, you totally could. And the reason I bring that up is to try not to mix the, the CSS and the jumping between D3 and the CSS and the HTML. This is clear, like this is this is something that you do very often uh, with D three, but maybe your D three box uh, plugin or extension or whatever you call it, yeah, uh, does that does it in the code. Let's just try it. If I get rid of position fixed in the actual CSS here, but instead I can set that sure. in style. Yeah, I can say yeah. position. Comma fixed. Yeah, it works. Yeah. So yeah, totally. We could we could your we could move all of these over there into the JavaScript. Mm. Yeah. No, I like that we know that it is a CSS attribute and it's you're using D3 to style elements. But um it's also just nice to know that you have that flexibility, I guess. Yeah. And I'm I'm often torn so, between, like, should I put it in the JavaScript or should I put it in the CSS? Because, like, I love the dynamic yeah, aspect. Yeah, well, that's the difference. To me, the main trade-off is, like, if you put it in the JavaScript, it's totally dynamic. So you could make it, like, mm. inside of a component, you could pass in some arguments and then set those styles based on those arguments dynamically. But if it's in the style tag, then, like, you have to set it, you know, in the CSS. And also, like, if you, <laughs> if you import some component, oftentimes you need to copy-paste some CSS as, like, a second step. Mm. But, like, if you do all this styling in the JavaScript, you don't need to do that. And it's, like, really right. self-contained. Right. So that's why I like it on, like, yeah. modules. But yeah, it's totally trade-off. Totally yeah. trade-off. And designers like CSS. Yeah. Mm, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, one question I thought people might have that are new to this is, how'd you make the box black? So I know you didn't set a fill oh. on this rectangle, but it, it, comes, out, it comes out black. Um, <laughs> And people might just be like, "Oh, well, how, how did that color appear? What's going on? How do you change it? What's the what's the attribute of the rectangle that I need to to do to change that?" But yeah, I know it's just a D three default, right? Well, actually, it's an SVG default, I guess. And also X yeah. and Y. See, I'm not defining X or Y because they default to zero. So let me just fill in all the defaults, like to make this whole thing more explicit. I think that would be better anyway. Fill is the is the color, F I L L, and by default it's black, and you could type in any CSS color string here, but you could make it you know purple. Yeah. <laughs> The last question before I have to bounce is what's the deal with that null value in your array that's passed into data? Oh yeah, that's like that's one of the trickier <laughs> one of the trickier things. And to be honest, it could be anything. You know, it could be one, it could be zero, it okay. could it could be an empty okay. object. The only thing that matters is there's one exactly one of them. So it's it's as though you had a data set like a, a a data table with a single element in it, a single row. The reason why I use null here is because I've seen this used in the the code for D3 axis. He uses the same pattern, and Mike Bostock himself uses null. So I'm like, okay, that's the precedent. I'm just going to use null and take it as a convention. Yeah. 
Is that because you have to have bound data in order to enter a yeah. selection? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's like a contrived uh, data array to make it such that mm. on the first invocation of this function here, the enter selection gets yeah. triggered and we, we append this SVG. And then on subsequent invocations, since there's already exactly one SVG, uh, this select all picks up the existing SVG and then enter doesn't trigger at all. So that's why we have to merge these two because uh, the result from this is the enter selection on the first invocation or the update selection on a subsequent invocation. And we want to set the width and height either way, so that's why we need to do this in merge. Could you do data and then inside data create a new array object? So I'm, I'm just curious, like, how you invoke a new array? Is it possible for like, that to work? Um, you know the... Oh, like you mean you new say, array. New array? Yeah, like, like the actual object. Like that? Or we could say one thing equals new array, and then do one thing dot push. No. That works. But it's just more Honestly. verbose. It's just more verbose than it needs uh, to be. Totally. Totally get that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the hardest thing about D3 in general. Like, this is what confuses, like, everybody I've tried to teach. Well, the way I think about it is, or the way that I've been trying to think about it is the enter selection, um, it's not going to have anything to loop over if it doesn't have an array to loop over. Yeah, totally. I think it's, it's kind of as simple as that. Like... You've got a selection, which is fantastic, but the enter works on a, an array, and without an array, it doesn't have anything to loop over. It doesn't have anything to execute on. Yeah. It can't do anything without data. So that's the, the, the missing link between your empty selection and putting some stuff in, in the body of your HTML. Yeah, totally, totally. And, you know, there is a way to do this where we could just create one data join and not do this second one, but I found that it was a little bit more cri more cryptic to read. But would you be curious to see it, how it plays out? Yeah, because it was actually a question of mine. I was like, why are you doing it twice? <laughs> I was like, what is that? Right, right. It's, it's so that this could be... It's like this, it's so that this is totally conceptually independent from this. Uh, but we could just do this once, but then have them like interlinked, tightly coupled. So let me just show yeah, you. Yeah. Let me just show you how that looks. I could say okay. const svg equals this, and then const svg enter equals just that that enter there. Then I can say yeah. svg dot merge svg dot ettr blah blah blah, right? Yeah. Then we can say const rect equals svg dot select all rect, and then instead of rect dot enter, we we can say svg enter. Dot select. Actually, because there's just going to be one rect, we can just use select. Oh no, svg enter dot append rect. Actually, we don't even need to assign it to a variable. svg dot select rect selects the existing rectangle that we appended the first time around, and then we can say dot merge with svg enter dot append rect uh, or mm, actually because, because we want to set these on the enter selection we need to reverse this sorry so svg enter dot append rect we set all these attributes and then we merge it with svg dot select rect 
yeah, I can see why you, you split them out. Right? <laughs> it's super confusing. But this doesn't work for some reason. I wonder what's going on there. Oh, I got my mobile development going. Cute little, cute little rectangle over there. This should work. Uh, oh, it is working. See, it is working. Mm. Somehow it didn't update before. Weird. Oh, it's only working on the second time around. Huh. Mm. Oh, it should be svg.merge svg enter. Yeah, because we weren't setting the width and height on the enter selection. Okay. Mm. But anyway, yeah. this is yeah. the pattern that I saw in uh, D3 Axis. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of super cool, but it's also super confusing. Definitely. <laughs> so It's good that you can still view when it's confusing. <laughs> so in a way, this is like more optimal because you're only doing one data join. But I think, yeah. you know, whatever efficiency is gained, like is sacrificed in readability. Mm. Well, that's good to know that it's an efficiency gain on the data join itself, which can be, uh, I mean, yeah, depending on the situation, it can be an area of improvement. Like for so, D3 axis, I think it's, I can understand why he would optimize it like that, because millions of people are going to use axes yeah. all, all over the place, right? Right. right. Yeah. All right, dude. Well, I've got to run. Hopefully those were some helpful questions. Um, it was all the like big ones that I had. And cool. I learned something because I I don't when I see null in an array I think of like something that doesn't exist but it's still an array. It's Is an array that? with one like, thing. That's all that matters. If there's one thing, yeah. Mm. Cool, man. Right on. Mm. Well, thanks for doing this. All right. Yeah, dude. All right. Thanks for Take thanks care. for making the video. Yeah, dude. You too. Bye. Bye.